Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. I'm still a bit under the weather, but you know what? We are going to get through this because we have a great program for you featuring, of course, uh, Rose. Welcome aboard, Rose William. I can see you in the chat room, folks. Remember, those of you who want to join and for me to be able to see your chat, you need to be on either YouTube or YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Egberto Willis. You can be on our Facebook page. Uh, of course, this is shared all over the place. But to, for, me to see this, for me to see your messages, you need to be on the particular Facebook page that we're on. So anyhow, folks, let me tell you, we are going to have a great show for you today. Uh, Rose Williams, one of our, well, I tell you what, I'll start the show and then I'll get there. Uh, title of the show today, the title of the show today is, Does America Have the Best Health Care? Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. And you know what, folks? This story, the story that we're going to talk about today, um, I found it mind-blowing. I mean, that is one of the reasons why I came on and, and switched, the, switched the topic that we're going to talk about today. And the reason we did that was because after I saw the story on TV, I mean, Rose, you were right. It blew me away. Because in that one story, although a whole lot of people are not going to... Because most people are apolitical or they don't look into the politics of things. They look at what's happening to them right away. So they don't immediately see these things. But my God, was that particular story riveted with realities in the American healthcare system. And the great thing about it is the same person going through the same condition had two countries, two different countries that she's involved with. And the country that purports to be the master of everything. The con and, and by the way, I don't want to take anything away from America. I am here from the Central America. I'm here from Panama because America, at the time that many of us came here, and America as far as what's promoted across the pond, across the continent, you can come here and do whatever you want. And you know what? For the most part, that had been true. I mean, there are some exceptions and there are some issues, etc. But it was a place where we hadn't reached the stage that we are at right now where it is, it, it, is a, it is a country in danger. It is a society in danger. It is a place where who knows what ultimately can happen. But we are going to get into that medical story in about five or six minutes. Because before we get there, you know, I tell you I don't want to talk a lot about impeachment because impeachment is not going to help our brothers and sisters in Appalachia. Impeachment are not going to help our brothers and sisters in the ghettos, the, the barrios, the ghettos, the, the, suburb, the suburbs, the exurbs, the rural areas, the farms. Impeachment is not going to help anything of that. It needs to be done. But let's leave the technocrats to do that. Let's work on that which affects most Americans right now. And that's what I ask of you. So if you're on impeachment, I'm going to give you a little impeachment taste here. Because the thing that I want to show you, what I want to show you on impeachment here uh, is Adam. this piece that Adam Schiff just did. I broke it down. I, I think I cut about five or six minutes, and I cut it down to about three point something minutes. But this piece, I tell you, should beat them all. Because what this piece shows is this piece shows how the, the kind of president we have, but it is even more dangerous than that. So I want you to check this out, and then we'll take it on the other side. In Helsinki in July of 2018, however, President Trump refused to acknowledge the Russian threat to our elections. When a reporter explicitly asked whether he believed Putin or the U.S. intelligence agencies on the issue of foreign interference in the 2016 election, President Trump said, quote, I don't see any reason why it would be Russia, and talked about the DNC server. So let me just say that we have two thoughts. You have groups that are wondering why the FBI never took the server. Why haven't they taken the server? 
Why was the FBI told to leave the office of the Democratic National Committee? I've been wondering that. I've been asking that for months and months, and I've been tweeting it out and calling it out on social media. Where is the server? I want to know, where is the server, and what is the server saying? With that being said, all I can do is ask the question. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me, and some others, they said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be, but I really do want to see the server. Uh, but I have, uh, I have confidence in both parties. I, I really believe that this will probably go on for a while, but I don't think it can go on without finding out what happened to the server. What happened to the servers of the Pakistani gentleman that worked on the DNC? Where are those servers? They're missing. Where are they? What happened to Hillary Clinton's emails? 33,000 emails, gone, just gone. I think in Russia, they wouldn't be gone so easily. I think it's a disgrace that we can't get Hillary Clinton's 33,000 emails. So I have I'm sure you remember this. It was, I think, unforgettable for every American, but I'm sure it was equally unforgettable for Vladimir Putin. I mean, there he is, the president of Russia, standing next to the president of the United States and hearing his own Kremlin propaganda talking points coming from the president of the United States. Now, if that's not a propaganda coup, I don't know what is. It's the most extraordinary thing. The President of the United States standing next to the President of Russia, our adversary, saying he doesn't believe his own intelligence agency. He's promoting this kooky, crazy server theory cooked up by the Kremlin, right next to the guy that cooked it up. It's a breathtaking success of Russian intelligence. I don't know if there's ever been a greater success of Russian intelligence. Whatever profile Russia did of our president, boy, did they have him spot on. Flattery and propaganda is all Russia needed. And as to Ukraine, they needed to deliver a political investigation to get help from the United States. This is just the most incredible propaganda coup. It's not just that the President of the United States standing next to Vladimir Putin is reading Kremlin talking points. He won't read his own national security staff talking points, but he will read the Kremlin ones. I, I love that bit at the end. He won't read his own, uh, his own points, right? But he sure will read the ones from the Kremlin. But anyhow, um, let's go ahead and get into the program. And um, what I want to do, first of all, is, is sort of, let's go ahead and get into the program. It goes as follows. This is one story on a medical series on Netflix. Uh, it should actually wake every American up. It illustrates the pathetic state of our healthcare system in many ways. We discuss healthcare a lot on politics, then, right? And you can understand why. It is something that affects just about everybody. Uh, Rose Williams, a, polit a Politics Done Right subscriber and supporter, asked me to watch the first episode of the Netflix series Diagnosis <clears throat> titled Detective Work. There is so much to unpack from that episode about our healthcare system. The program is decidedly non-political. I mean, and that, that's the thing about that is the beauty of it. It was completely non-political. It had to be the uh, it had to be lest one would be excoriating our entire healthcare industrial complex instead of getting to the good work being done by the doctor Lisa Sanders in crowdsourcing diagnosis. I could not help but make this the main topic of today's program. I couldn't help it. Um, there was no choice. After seeing this, and I'm going to show you the excerpt that I've cut out. Uh, I'm, I'm cutting it out with fair use. Uh, I'm doing it in fair use, just a little snippet. And those of you who, I mean, this, this series alone, this series alone is worth a subscription to Netflix. I'll just put it that way. Um, anybody not, and I'm not a, here to sell Netflix or try to tell everybody to go to Netflix or whatever, but after looking at this and seeing some other pieces of this particular series, it is clear to me that uh, this is something that we need uh, to take a look at. Uh, this is something that I think is worth our, our time. So, you know, uh, let me go ahead and play that and we'll take it on the other side. So let me go ahead and do that real quick. 
Hello. How are you doing today? Fine. You? I'm good. Uh, one of the first questions like I just had was, you've already thought about a diagnosis, and like doctors here hasn't even mentioned any of that. What made you lead to the diagnosis you did? Well, I'm kind of used to see these symptoms associated with these kind of pathologies. And when I read your story, there was one girl with kind of the same symptoms. So you think it would be super beneficial if I went to you? Yeah, I think so. Once you are there the day after, you know if there is something metabolic or not. The genetic exam with, with also a blood sample to confirm it. I'd never got t tested yeah. for anything like this. <laughs> yeah, so it would be super awesome if we could go out there or just to get looked at by people who are interested <laughs> and want to find yeah. out. You guys sound more on track than any doctor I've ever had, so... Um, for if we come out there, I know, like, money and stuff, is this necessarily, like, an expensive test, or...? Yeah, the health system is public, so we pay a tax for it. Oh, wow. People with this kind of pathology, so with this um, metabolic disease, usually have an... I mean, they have not to pay anything because it's a rare disease. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's super different out here. <laughs> Complete <Yeah>. opposite. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your time, and I really, really appreciate well, it. And um, I'm hoping we'll be in touch, and maybe yeah. sometime soon we'll Are be you? meeting each other in person. <laughs> Have a nice day. Okay, um, first of all, I, I, I need to give you some background. This young woman, for over nine years, I believe, or a decade or somewhere in that regards, uh, she, start, she was an athlete, she was very athletic, but suddenly she came down with a condition where her muscles and everything would pain like crazy. I mean, she just had a whole lot of pain, uh, period. Now, but that was, you know, a lot of people would attribute that to, oh, well, you know, a lot of people have arthritis or something of that nature, you know, no big deal. She's been to doctor after doctor after doctor, and nobody was able to diagnose this woman with exactly what was wrong with her. But it got a whole lot worse. Welcome aboard, uh, May Woods. Uh, but nothing could be done for her as far as these guys were concerned, right? I mean, uh, it, as it turns out, uh, nobody could figure out what the hell is wrong with this woman. What's wrong with her? And eventually, I mean, even, uh, and, and this is a bad thing and this is a scary thing. There was a time where she said her urine was like chocolate milk or, or something, uh, something like that. And the reason why, of course, was her muscles were, whatever condition that she had, her muscles were degenerating affecting these these real uh, these real hurts onto her body okay now she's been to many doctors all these doctors what do they do what do they always do they charge you an arm and a leg but ultimately they were unable ultimately they were unable to help her but you know what she got she got the bills there was no problem in billing her for not curing her. So, I mean, that is one of the only professions, right, where you can go ahead and heal. I mean, you can go ahead and charge somebody continuously. You charge them up the gazoo, but you never heal them. So she was never healed. She's been sued. Uh, she's, uh, she's going bankrupt. She said she was going to uh, file for bankruptcy. So she, uh, this doctor, I think her name is Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Lisa Sanders. She has a project uh, where she decided to crowdsource uh, diagnoses. In other words, put your condition as descriptive as you can all over uh, in, in her network somehow. And other people would go into that network and they would read your condition. And the idea behind crowdsourcing applies the same everywhere. Crowdsourcing says uh, the brains of a million people is more effect or, um, is more effect or, or the brains of a million people are more effective than the brain of one person or ten people or whatever. So crowdsourcing is is a is a good thing. So that's what they did 
for her. They put her stuff up there in a crowdsourcing manner and people actually were able to uh, come out with different conditions that may be the prob maybe the issue. But here's the kicker. Why I said there are several there were several permutations to the meaning of this story. We are led to believe. Uh, Rose also points out not only uh, not cure her, they couldn't even give her a diagnosis. That is correct. But but here's a, the the kind of kicker to this story, right? We pur purport to have the best health care, and you know, there's no doubt that. We have so much money, we have so much technology that we probably have the best, the best healthcare technology, uh, the best healthcare money can buy with technology. But you know that is only one component of healthcare, right? Um, what else do you need in healthcare? You actually need somebody who is going to touch the patient, somebody who is going to have the time to listen to the patient. You also need to not be concerned that you're spending too much time with that patient. You also need to make sure that you can spend the appropriate time with that patient so that you can be told by that patient all that is wrong so that you can actually get a solution. Okay? Now, so what has happened? That didn't happen with this woman. In, in effect, she goes to the doctor. They throw her into the hospital. They build her insurance, whatever she has. And voila, she's in a whole lot of debt. And when uh, it's time for the bills to be paid, they sue her for the money. So here is a woman. Pay a, and I, I want you guys to understand this before we move on because... Uh, we have taken this to mean something uh, as is just the way things are. If you go ahead and you ask somebody to come to your home and they repair something for you, you expect the result and you pay for that result. If you pay for that result and that thing is still not effectively working, you call them back because it's under warranty and you're not charged again for them not having done the job. That is how it normally works, right? But in a healthcare system, in a capitalist society, in this type of a market, you don't have to be successful in treating, in solving, in, in a product. You, you know, we like to call, we like to treat healthcare as a product or a service like any other product or service. People like myself would always tell people, healthcare is not a product. Healthcare is not that type of service as we do in a capitalist society. It is not. It belongs in another, in another framework. Why? Like I said, if you have a repair made to your car and it's done incorrectly, you take it back, it costs you no more money for them to make it right. If you are, however, sick and they claim to have made you healthy, but they never really solve the problem, if you have to go back to them, you don't go ahead and say, okay, you didn't do it right. You go back to them and you pay again. Now, this young lady has been paying over and over and over again for a condition that was never diagnosed, but they're even suing her because she couldn't pay. But here's the kicker. So here we are in the United States of America, the place that has the best insurance in the or rather, the best healthcare in the world purportedly, and that can that no other country is better. None, none of these doctors can find a problem. Before I talk about the doctor who found the problem, I want to say something about the doctors here in America. The truth of the matter is I think all the technology that was used in that foreign country to diagnose this young lady could have been done right here in the United States had a doctor had her interest at hand and not the interest of getting paid or how they would get paid at hand. Why is that? Because they would have, given that they have failed to come up with a diagnosis, they would have gone through the entire battery of tests that are necessary. And by the way, all those batteries of tests can be done right here in the United States. So if we had a doctor who cared for the patient and not their private economies, there is a good possibility that this problem would not have been occurred and she would have been diagnosed. I don't want to be foolproof. I mean, somehow to say, oh, all these, con these other countries that are not as advanced as us could find it, but we could. We could find it if it were in our interest. And that's what I want you to understand here. I want you to understand that 
The reason her condition wasn't found wasn't that it could not have been found in America, but because of the nature of our healthcare that puts capital over humanity. Capital over humanity. Capital over humanity. And when we understand that, we will be ready to get rid of this system in its entirety and implement what everybody else in the rest of the world has. So here's the deal, what she did. Finally, she's talking and talking to different people. And by the way, if you, if you watch the series, you'll see that other people came close to the diagnosis that it's been a uh, not being able to handle fatty acids kind of a thing as well. Okay? But here's what happens. She gets a call from a, an intern in Italy. And this Italian intern says, you know, I've seen this before. I think we can have you diagnosed in a day. And she said, okay, that would be great. What does that mean? Do you need to see me in Italy? Yes, you need to come to Italy. Well, she understands that, remember, she's broke. She doesn't have any money. The American healthcare industrial complex has taken all her money, not diagnosed her. Again, they have taken her money, thousands of dollars, no diagnosis, but she owes it and they're suing her. In other words, you pay for us not curing you, okay? You must pay for us not finding your diagnosis, but you pay anyway. I mean, I wish I could go ahead and provide a service. I wish I could say, you know what? In the days that I developed software, I wish I could have a whole lot of bugs in my software. And then when Boeing comes to me and says, Egberto, that thing that we're using to test the 777 communication system is not working. You have a bug in it. And I say, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> you want me to fix that bug, you better pay me. They would, say, they would take me to court, which is something I think it's a novel idea we should maybe start trying to do with doctors and hospitals. In other words, um, if they don't find a cure and they send you a bill, send it back and say, when you find a cure, I'll pay you. I will pay you when you find a cure. But anyhow, so what happens is she goes ahead and she takes off to... Um, she takes off to Italy, she, but before that, she's scared about money. I don't have any money. Um, how much is this going to cost? Well, ma'am, in Italy, we have a public health care system, and the public health care system, everyone is covered, including you, an American citizen, that when we talk about our health care, we want to know if you have your papers. Are we covering illegals? Are we covering, you know, I mean... The mentality of the country that preaches to be moral. Right now, the, 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 the gotcha questions at the democratic debate when we're discussing Medicare for all is, is it going to cover those darn, those darn illegals? You know, though, that's our mentality. That's what the Trumpians, that's what the, the centrists, that's what all these people have taught us to, how to think, right? They think, they teach us how to be selfish. They teach us how to be immoral. They teach us how to be, just think uh, about capital over humanity, right? So you, I mean, it was amazing listening to this conversation, right? So she's talking to this intern. No, ma'am, you don't have to worry about the hell. You have a disease that's considered a chronic disease. It's not only that you would only pay a little. You will pay nothing. It's one of those diseases because it's a metabolic disease, because it is one that, has, that is difficult to die, you don't get charged for this. Just come to the country. And she goes to the country. They do a full test on her. Well, they couldn't give her the diagnosis in one day, of course, because as it turns out, she didn't have a metabolic, that type of a metabolic problem that could be tested that way. Her problem was more genetic in nature. So what they, the way they found that was doing a full, uh, a full what do they call it, a, a, a full genome analysis on her genes. And a, few, a couple of months later, they had the results of all of that. They called her up. They told her exactly what was wrong with her. She could have the kids that she's going to want. All these things turned out just fine for her. All she had to do was be very cognizant of what she eats. I mean, the difference in healthcare. You know, people always talk about everybody running to America. There is no European 
that's going to run to America for health care. You know what? They'll run to America for dual citizenship. In other words, they'll take advantage of our laissez-faire capitalism where it helps them, but they'll never... You know, I have friends from Canada, right? And I'll be like, uh, did you give up your Canadian citizenship? They look at me, are you crazy? I have great health care. If something happens to me, I'm heading back home. And, and, and that is the mentality of others. You know, we are so behind the ball. We are so behind in the way we think. And until we start thinking the appropriate way, until we start saying to ourselves, we deserve what everybody else has had for such a long time. We shouldn't have to go broke. That young girl was 23 years old and already bankrupt from a healthcare system that could not cure her. I repeat, a 23-year-old girl with or a woman, a 23-year-old woman with a chronic disease bankrupted by a healthcare system that could not find a diagnosis for her problem. And then she went to a foreign country, paid zero for them to diagnose her, tell her what her problem was so she could come back to the United States of America and just eat the appropriate foods and have a cure. So finding the cure cost her a plane ticket. While the doctors and the American health industrial complex ripped her off, took her to court, sued her for not giving them a cure, for not giving her a diagnosis. People, do you understand the evil within the system? Do you understand where these people put capital over humanity? Do you understand where we are and that we have allowed ourselves to become immoral? That story had then several points. Punto numero uno was whether we cure you, whether we diagnose you, we bill you. Happens nowhere else. Punto numero dos. Um, we don't really care about you, if we can't find anything about you, just get the hell out of the way. Punto numero tres. Other countries, when they're providing service to you, don't sit back and say, do you have your papers? Are you legal? Are you an illegal? Are you a, an alien? They understand what health is all about, a human right. Punto numero cuatro. And you know what? In understanding healthcare as a right, we ensure that all of our tax dollars go to solve the problems of us all, the healthcare issues of us all. This is not rocket science. This is not difficult. This is just human. This is just how things are supposed to be. Look, Rose Williams, uh, I thank you for that. Um, and by the way, Rose, uh, right on here, thank you for being not only a, a regular subscriber to Politics Done Right, but also a great contributor to Politics Done Right. Folks, we need other folks to, um, to do that, to make sure that we can stay uh, doing what we are supposed to get done. Those of you who are listening on Facebook, you can always be supporters and, 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 and helpers of Politics Done Right by hitting that dollar sign on the YouTube uh, page, just click that dollar sign and you can you can do whatever you want right there. Those of you who are on listening to us on podcast, I'm going to tell you how you can actually help the program right now and then we'll move on. I'm going to try to do all of this in two minutes. So stay with me and please remember to share these programs. Please remember to share these programs. But if you want to uh, support Politics Done Right and we need you to support Politics Done Right, the first the first thing we normally ask uh, as support, the, the, the best support is a constant stream, and that comes via what we call our Patreon page, which you can find at patreon.com slash politics done right. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash politics done right. I just entered that into the stream. Uh, you can also decide to work, uh, help us with our equipment upgrade. You know, we're, uh, we travel a lot, and we like to have the appropriate equipment that we can stream from anywhere. 
you can uh, go to gofundme.com slash independent dash media dash upgrade. That is independ- uh, gofundme.com slash independent dash media dash upgrade. You can also uh, go directly to PayPal to help us out there. And the PayPal is at paypal.me slash politics done right. Again, that is paypal.me slash politics done right. And of course, you can always go to our store and purchase anything that we have at the store. All of your purchases go towards assistant politics done right. And what do you get at the store? What do you get at the store? Let's check that out. I support independent media. You can go to store.politicsdoneright.com. Again, that is store.politicsdoneright.com. I support independent media. And we also have a little teaser for Donald Trump, which says, on uh, a a president, I forget what it says. But anyhow, it's the one that says an unconventional president requires unconventional exit or something to that nature. Look, uh, all all these things support politics done right we ask you so kindly to do so okay let's go ahead and get back to the program don't want to spend too much time there but anyhow folks look i want to thank you guys for listening in uh let me go ahead and read some of the messages that we have here i don't have any top chats yet come on folks let me have a top chat a top chat so i can call you out on fate or rather on 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 uh, youtube Okay, let's let's go to the chat. Uh, let's see. Karen Andreessen says, uh, let me welcome all of you guys first. Amy, welcome, Amy. Welcome, Amy. Let's see. All right. Uh, and Karen, TLC had a TV show called Chasing the Cure. It used crowdsourcing and specialists to help diagnose patients, often with rare conditions. Some of the people had insurance and others uh, of them had gone bankrupt looking for a diagnosis. For those with insurance, insurance companies routinely denied doctors' requests for genetic testing. The show or individual doctors donated the genetic testing that led to the diagnosis. You know, and, and that is, that is a, the thing that, that I hate the most with our system. We should not have to have a GoFundMe so that you, especially if you have insurance, right, so that you can go ahead and get a cure. You pay, you pay your insurance and you pay for something and you don't get the results. Come on now. That is simply not fair at all. Okay. Amy also says, it took two years of bi-monthly appointments to get a fibromyalgia diagnosis and there's no cure, only symptom relief. Yeah, you are, uh, that is in the same family with lupus, a, a disease that my wife has. Um, and with, with fibromyalgia, it eventually, I mean, it's a thickening of a lot of your linings. But you know what? With uh, steroids, it is, you know, you live a normal life. I mean, yes, it's painful a lot of times. But I'm so happy you had somebody who had the wherewithal to diagnose you, Amy, because that family of disease, that family of autoimmune diseases is brutal. And when I say it can be brutal, you know it, you live it, it can be brutal, Amy. But you know what? It's great that they found a diagnosis. And not only that, Amy, it is great that you're doing well. I'm pretty sure they have you on some sort of a steroidal, uh, steroidal type of a deal to take care of, uh, to take care of that. Okay, let's see. Uh, Rose, uh, Karen, Andres, an excellent example, an excellent point. Absolutely so. Uh, Amy also says, lost home job ended up in homeless. Oh, raising young daughter on welfare, public housing. Took five years to get it, get into a home. Uh, Amy, if you're at a phone, I would love to get your story on the phone calling in right now because this is you, you are real. That is a story that needs to be told. If you, Amy, if you can call us right now at 646 716 5812, if you're still here with us, I would love so much to talk to you. Right now, 646-716-5812. If you have the wherewithal to give us a call, I would love to talk uh, to you. Uh, uh, you lost your home. You lost your job. That, Amy, let me tell you the importance of stories like yours. Most Americans, uh, like I've always told people, most Americans are not sick all at the same time. 
And what happens is we also are many times forgetful. I hope this is you. 360, let me get you on air right now. Okay, 360, you are on right now. Would this be Amy? Yes, this is Amy. Amy, how are you doing today? I'm okay. It's raining. Yeah, it's raining. Well, Amy, um, I, I just read your note on, on that you have here where you said that you were diagnosed with fibromyalgia. It took them a very long time to find that out. Is that correct? Yes. And it is also correct that... Go through. And is it also correct that you have you spent a whole lot of money and time trying for them to do their job and find that diagnosis? Yeah, it was really difficult because um, I had to get on the um, social services in order to be able to have medical care uh -huh. and the medical guidelines for um, you know all of all of the doctors that are you know listed on that program are very um, Western, right. you know, and there's a lot of issues with like thinking that um, fibromyalgia is a disease of the mind, you know, and it's not like a it doesn't have a physiological, um, <clears throat> you know, base, but it's a, it's actually like a neurological disorder that it has to do with the messaging in the brain as well as um, dealing with the, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system relationship where you don't have enough parasympathetic. You have a, a reduced um, uh, anti-adrenaline system. So your body is almost constantly living in a state of crisis. Right. Well, like I, I, like I, I mentioned on, on the chat room, my wife has lupus, which is also an autoimmune yeah. disease. And it's in the same family, and, and the diagnosis is very difficult. But the thing about it is, while they're trying to figure things out, instead of looking at the data analytically, you pay. Now, tell us a little about what this healthcare system meant for you. Because if I understand you correctly, it, 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 it really puts you in a bad spot. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, I've had to go through a number of different doctors, um, and I finally settled on one who eventually gave me the diagnosis, but I had to go through several years of um, doing things that proved that it wasn't some other disease. So it's a, it, it, at the time, and I'm not sure if it's still the same now, but at the time it was a diagnosis that can only be made by um, making sure that you don't have every single other disease that might right. have some similar symptomology, right? Um, and then <clears throat> in order for me to apply for Social Security and be on DSHS and continue to get um, $420 a month, <laughs> which should be really shocking for a lot of people it's that don't amazing. understand how little money you get. There, if the housing toggle um, isn't working correctly, $420 a month for two people, for an adult disabled woman and a child is a ridiculous amount of money. There's no way that anybody can survive on that. Anyways, I digress. Um, she eventually um, was so uncomfortable with filling out the forms that were required by both the local GSHS and Social Security office that she was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. I can't, I can't fill these forms out, you know, indefinitely. Um, after I'd been seeing her for years and she had diagnosed me and knew the extent um, of my disorder um, was keeping me um, from working. Not all fibromyalgia patients are, have such a, a severe case as I do. Right. I have a cousin who has it and she's um, able to maintain her job, but I'm not. I haven't been able to. It's just debilitating. Um, so... I had to, she, it was so horrible. She decided that she was, was like, you don't have to fill these out anymore. Well, I'll figure out something else, you know, in order to be able to, to do this. And then I talked to the manager of their office and then she threatened me um, saying that I had refused to do a urine analysis in order to get oh, God. the prescription drugs. Right. Yeah. And I said, nobody asked me for a urine analysis. Nobody had ever actually asked me for a UA, which I would have been happy to provide. But they were, so basically she was threatening me with, um, with re, you know, reporting me as a drug seeker, which if, you know, they had looked at, you know, my history of prescriptions, they would know that that's just totally not true. So um, I had to change doctors again, 
And finally, on like the this was the third doctor we were able to get Social Security. Um, the first attempt for Social Security, they denied that I ever even made it, that I had ever made the application. And then the second time, I had DSHS following me to make sure that they they knew that they knew, right? Like Social Security knew that DSHS was watching that I had actually made the made the um, application. <clears throat> and then. Um, I still got denied, and the judge said that my doctor had misdiagnosed me, oh. which is not legal. Right. It's not a legal thing. You know, she said, I don't have fibromyalgia. I have myalgia. Uh, what state are you um, in? And uh, Washington. Okay. A bunch of the, um, most of the Social Security uh, lawyers have actually gone out of business here because um, the a few years back, the... Um, the the whole like all the judges were replaced, um, and they're just like you know they're just rubber stamping everything, you know denied. denied. Now how did so you come about losing time, your home? I, um, I I had no money. I couldn't work. I I couldn't pay rent. Um, I ended up you know in um, staying at family with families and um, friends in different places. Uh, I, I stayed with uh, my ex-husband's mom and uh, his brother for a while, and um, also his nephew. I stayed at, at at his house. I stayed in, you know, friends from high school in California. I went down there and stayed there for a little while. My daughter ended up going to um, a different school almost every year from middle school all the way to. Gosh, her sophomore year in high school. Oh my God. Yeah, and it was it was just it was excruciating. Well, look, Amy, I, I, it's I, so difficult, and and all those things, all that stress, just like makes the the, you know, yeah. the symptoms of fibromyalgia worse. Autoimmune diseases are very stress related as well. Yeah. But look, Amy, I just wanted I just wanted America to hear the voice of uh, your, your average American citizen who just happened to be unlucky enough to have fibromyalgia and then have a system that isn't equipped to to, uh, to be humane with it. Look, yeah, I had it. You know, I was happy. I had like the, my favorite job that I've ever had in my whole life. I was, you know, in a in a new town, and I was just I was loving it. I loved you know working. I worked at a nursery, and right. I was just like. So so tickled that I was getting paid to like, you know, deadhead flowers. Right. You know, and I had, you know, I had a full time job and I was and I was working and Evelyn was just about to go to um, go to school. Amy, you um, are the result just, of a system. Amy, Amy, you I mean, nothing you did wrong. You just happen to be human and uh, living in an inhumane health industrial complexed system. Thank you so kindly for the call, Amy. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for calling in. Okay, let's go to 409. Come on in, 409. Hello? Yes, you're on. Oh, hey, Egberto, it's Anand. Anand, talk to me, my friend. Well, what's the topic of the day? I thought you were listening to the last caller that came in, my brother. Actually, the topic of the day was a story on Netflix that I rose brought to our attention about crowdsourcing healthcare. But I got a whole lot of stories out of that that one because, as it turns out, uh, while we couldn't diagnose this particular rare disease here in the United States, uh, a, a telecom a tele doctor over in Italy did it, and when. Uh, she asked how much would it charge would they charge him to diagnose her in Italy? They said zero because we have public health care in Italy. Fly over here and we'll take care of you. And guess what? They took care of good well good care of her. Well, uh today uh there was a bake sale at my hospital because I think somebody who was a part time employee did not have PTOT did not have paid time off uh -huh. and needed a surgery. So the bake sale in the hospital for a hospital employee for her surgery and time off. So forget about going on Netflix. You, we have these fundraisers at least twice a month for employees of the hospital in the hospital. That is a shame. Anand, 
I want you to tell me that story again in a bloggable format. Let me ask the question. Anan, I understand there was an interesting bake sale at your hospital. You're a doctor at the hospital. Tell me why is it that an employee at the hospital had a bake, or some people at the hospital had a bake sale for the employee? Okay. Uh, well, next time a bake sale comes up, I'll, I'll ask for more details. Okay. <laughs> anyway, anything else is up on it? It's every month, so I mean, I'm, I, it's going to happen. That's how bad it is. Excellent. Anything else you want to add, Anon? Um, uh, what, 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 what's happening in Texas locally with those registration numbers I sent you? One million new Texas registrations. You claim that Donald Trump is going to win by 3.3%, the smallest percentage win by a Republican. I'm going to up you one. Donald Trump will lose Texas, and it's going to be a new day. Oh, well, um... If if we look at the registration numbers, uh, approximately, if we take that 16.1 million, mm -hmm. I looked at the last elections, approximately 59.5% of those people vote. Yes. So if we get that to like 62 or 63% uh, of the registered voters, not the overall population, because many people are not even registered. Right. If in Texas, we can get that... The, the people registered, if we can get that to 62 or 60, I think about 62 or 63 percent, we'll do it. Donald Trump can lose. But I, I was predicting the 3.3 percent, assuming only 60 percent of people would vote. I, I got and Anand. I would predict that Donald Trump would lose by three. Anand, by three. this election is 63 percent. It's, it's in the he's gone. Dr. Bot, let me tell you something, Dr. Bot. This an election is going to be monumental. All of us together here, the listeners that I have on air right now, you and many other millennials out there and, out and, and, the, and the good boomers and the good Gen Xers and the good Gen Ys and all of I think this election is going to surprise a lot. And I don't think the pollsters really know exactly what's going to happen right now. I am predicting that we are going to have a real one. Hey, Anand, I got to go back to the subject. So anything else real quick? No, uh, that's, well, uh, the other thing is, um, uh, since you're talking about, uh, is I think a lot of arthritis and chronic diseases, uh, rheumatological, are, I, I think they're uh, harder to diagnose in the U.S. because they don't emphasize physical exam. Exactly. You just, you just named it's it. It's all technology. Exactly. Got to go, my brother. Thank you so kindly for calling in as usual. Anand, uh, tell, tell everybody hi for me, okay? Sure thing. Take care, buddy. Okay, let me go back here to the scroll to make sure I can get to everybody. Okay, we have Rose says, Thank goodness I have a job that, uh, that is considered good insurance but still costs a ton of money. Years after aggressive cancer treatment, I have developed both an autoimmune disease and an immune deficiency of unknown cause. It's pretty stressful being sick all the time. Rose, I get it. I see it not only in you but in so many people. But you know what, Rose? We are going to, I mean, together we're going to get this stuff taken care of. Amy, six years to be approved for SSDI after three attempts. That is a shame. And let's see, Amy also says, now Trump is trying to cut SSDI guidelines. Yes, I know. In fact, that is one of the articles. If you take a look at our blog post for the show today, that's in there. Uh, Amy also said, not all first steroids, only pain relief. Amy, act, you know, I'm surprised that they don't offer you steroids because if I remember correctly from doing the research on these autoimmune diseases, uh, the steroids actually arrests the progression. And you know what? Uh, prednisone is pretty darn cheap. So I'm, I, I would consult your, your uh, primary physician to see if steroids wouldn't be helpful in your case because what steroid does is it calms down the immune system from attacking itself, which is what happens in lupus. It's what happens in, uh, in uh, all these other forms uh, of, of autoimmune diseases. Michael D. Newton, the good Rx ad is horrible. The working mom and uh, with her kids who can't afford her son's Rx only in the USA. It's a shame, Michael Dean Newton. You're absolutely right. Amy says, capitalism requires the suffering of the underclass. Anyone can end up in an insufferable situation. You know, Amy, we have to have people like you shouting that from the mountaintop. But, you know, let me tell you what happens, Amy. One of the reasons I asked you to call into the show, right, 
is that a lot of folks that, you know, y- you may be down on, on your luck, you may be down on your health, you may be down on these things. All of this occurs in silence, right? So all the people you see on TV are all the people that are living happy and things are going great and everybody's looking at the TV and that's what they want to see. What we don't have is a platform f- for people to see America and not what not the Facebook platform where everybody looks happy. But we want that platform where everybody has a voice to tell how things really are. And that is what I'm talking about, folks. That is what I'm talking about. This show belongs to all of you. This show means that, you know what? And by the way, folks, we can still take a couple more calls. 646-716-5812 if you want to call in. 646-716-5812. I'm going to say it slower. People tell me I talk real fast. 646 646- 7165812 if you're listening on podcast just go to politicsdoneright.com politicsdoneright.com look amy you're right it's social programming but you know what amy social programming only works as long as we stay programmed and one of the things that i refuse to do and if you take a look at some of the other independent media that we work with in fact right after this show i will be on with uh, I'll, I'll be interviewing uh, Tom Hartman. Tom Hartman is a guest right after this. I'm, I'm going to be recording a, an interview with him that I'll play. Uh, well, his book comes out on February 11th. I'm not sure if I, I need to hold the interview until February 11th or not. But all our, all our subscribers are going to be able to see that interview and they'll also get a special message from El Señor. So look, folks, I want to tell you this. If you're listening to this show, I want you to uh, not only not only support shows like this and and, and websites like uh, like you know the, the Daily Coast and all the others. Let me tell you why it's important. Because, like I said, number one, the people that need to have a voice that tell other people what can happen to them. It's not out there. Nobody wants to put them out there. Everybody wants a happy face all of the times, right? So therefore, we have millions of Americans suffering in silence. I did a program called Americans Are Perfect. Americans just know how to suffer in silence, you know? Nobody wants to let anybody know that things are difficult. Nobody wants to let anybody know that you didn't pass this test. Nobody wants to let anybody know that you failed at something. One of the things I started doing early on in my life is every time I failed, I would tell people I failed. Every time I succeeded, I would say it not in a bragging form, hey, I finally did it. And every time I tried a new thing, I always went at it with a passion. And there's a reason why that I try to use it as a template. Because again, most people suffer in silence. Most people think that there are certain things that only they go through because they're made to believe that. But you know what? We can all be that canvas, right? We can all be that canvas that show folks, let's just show our humanity, no? Let's just show who we are. Let's just do the things that everybody does that too many are scared of doing. So you fail at something, you know, I failed at, you know, my daughter, you know, I looked at her one time, you know, when she was having some issues in, in, in medical school, I, I, told, I had a heart to heart with my daughter. And I said, you know what? I have failed more than I have succeeded the reason why is when you're, when you're succeeding, you try to hold on to that success as long as possible. Well, if you're like me, after a while, you, you throw it away and say, hey, I'm going to become a political activist. Well, you think, oh, somehow that's going to be... Anyhow, not the story. But folks, look. I sat down and I spoke to her and I said, I failed more than I've succeeded. But you know what is one thing? As long as I have breath in these lungs, as long as I can stand up, as long as I can move my hands... As long as I can do something. Hey, there's life, man. And, and there's always that impetus to uplift folk. There's always that impetus to empower folk. There's always that impetus to really, really bring people along and say, you know what, folks? 
we're all the damn same and we all the same problem. There's no, no point in faking it. So politics done right is yours. Everybody who is a part of this show has a voice. Please, please remember that. Please share this program. Please let everybody know that there's a place to go. Please let everybody know that we really, we're not, we, we don't just talk this stuff. We live this stuff. We mean this stuff. We're going to have to get out of here. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! <laughs>